Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you whom I haven't met, my name is James Ross and I chair the Board of Trustees of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And it's my very pleasant uh, role this afternoon to welcome you all to the council chamber of this splendid and historic Liverpool Town Hall. Uh, but uh, actually we're not just here to admire the architecture and the splendours of historic Liverpool. We're here to attend the latest in the LSTM Leverhulme lectures. And this series was actually inaugurated in 1997 by the then director of LSTM, Professor David Molyneux, who was with us this morning but uh, can't be here this evening. And uh, he, with the Viscount Leverhulme and the support of the Leverhulme Charitable Trust, established this series, which has been going ever since. And it was aimed, and continues indeed, to attract lecturers of international distinction in their particular fields. This year, the 15th of these lectures, uh, forms an integral part of the consultation program of CARD, CARD being, as you know, the Collaboration for Applied Health Research and Delivery. Bit of a mouthful. That uh, collaboration is taking place, uh, that, that uh, review of the program is taking place today and will continue tomorrow. More about that later. But it's my privilege to welcome and introduce our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Tim Evans, who is the Director of Health nutrition and population in the Human uh, Development Network at the World Bank. The mission of the World Bank, as I'm sure you know, is to end extreme poverty within a generation. The mission of LSTM is to reduce the burden of sickness and mortality in disease endemic countries through the delivery of effective interventions which improve human health and are relevant to the poorest communities. So I think you would agree that our two missions are well aligned. Now, Tim Evans, prior to taking up his present position last year, was from 2010 to 2013, Dean of the James P. Grant School of Public Health at Brack University in Dakar, Bangladesh, and Senior Advisor to the Brack Health Programme. From 2003 to 2010, he was Assistant Director General at the World Health Organization, and prior to this, he served as Director of the Health Equity Theme at the Rockefeller Foundation. Earlier in his career, he was an attending physician of internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and was Assistant Professor of International Health Economics at the Harvard School of Public Health, and he's a board member of numerous international health alliances. Tim has been at the forefront of advancing global health equity and strengthening health systems delivery for over 20 years. While at the WHO, he led the Commission on so the Social Determinants of Health and oversaw the production of the annual World Health Report. He's been a co-founder of many partnerships, including the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunization, Gavi, as well as uh, leading efforts to increase access to HIV treatment for mothers and innovative approaches to training community-based midwives in Bangladesh. Tim re uh, received his med medical degree at McMaster University in Canada and was a research and internal medicine president at Bingham and, and uh, Women's Hospital. He earned his DPhil uh, in Agricultural Economics from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. I'm glad for that last one, because an alumnus, at least he's got one distinguished institution on his CV. <laughs> uh, anyway, no more of that. Let me ask you, please, to welcome our speaker this evening, Dr. Tim Evans. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, 
can people hear me? I'm wired, um, and I th think I I won't go off unless uh, I speak for too long, and that way, at that time, I'll disappear through a trap door. Um, thank you very much. It's a great honor to uh, uh, be a recipient of the Leverton uh, Lecture um, and Prize, um, and uh, I will try and give you some uh, a little bit of uh, uh, further uh, uh, nourishment uh, and reflection, uh, although I must say after the presentations today, this will be a tall order. Uh, I thought they were uh, really very, very stimulating and covered a vast terrain, uh, and I think that's a reflection of a very healthy uh, activity um, or a good deck of cards. Uh, that uh, is part of this um, uh, consortium on applied research and, develop, uh, and delivery. Uh, I'm going to talk about delivery research in global health, um, and uh, it, I think it's, uh, as we saw today, it's in a very exciting time, and, and it's a really a pregnant moment, meaning I think it's an opportunity uh, for this field to move forward um, in a much more prominent way um, than it's played in the past. Um, I'm going to talk about knowledge and know-how uh, for health delivery and that it matters. Uh, I'll talk about targets for improvement in delivery as something that we need to set and be ambitious about. I'll talk about riding a third wave of evidence for universal health coverage um, and then finish uh, at about 7.30 this evening. Uh, talking about investing in the science and practice uh, of the science of uh, delivery. So knowledge and know-how for health systems. Um, we have a situation which uh, many of you uh, were uh, presenting today, which is uh, one of pervasive inequities in many health services, but this uh, shows maternal and child health services coverage. And these are income quintiles, and you can see uh, that across a whole set of countries, when you look at the poorest, Q1, uh, relative to the richest, you see this stepwise gradient uh, in access to life-saving uh, and health-enhancing uh, or preserving interventions. Um, when you look at it on a country basis, you see that the pattern is actually quite interesting, and this is a slide from uh, the countdown process, which uh, describes access along the continuum of maternal child health care from antenatal care, um, the first visit through to the postnatal uh, uh, starting of uh, family planning and contraceptive use. Again, uh, you can see that this pattern of coverage uh, differs according to the type of intervention uh, and also to the income quinta. And so on the bottom, you have the, uh, the poorest, and you can see they uh, really are well below um, uh, the, the rest of the pack, um, but have particularly low coverage for facility-based interventions, skilled attendance at delivery, institutional deliveries. But then when it comes to postnatal visits and breastfeeding, uh, you can see that the inequities uh, largely disappear, uh, but then reemerge again as you move into some of the childhood interventions, DPT-1, full vaccination of the child and, and maternal use of contraceptive of contraception um, in the postnatal period. So these patterns are, are interesting ones. They're not consistent for across all interventions and ones that we need to understand and look at. Um, in addition, uh, beyond maternal child health, uh, we see that there's sort of a, a vicious circle of, um, of uh, uh, greater inequities that are faced by poor populations. Uh, we had a couple of pop, uh, our presentation on the costs of accessing tuberculosis care today, both the direct and indirect costs. And this was a slide that we used in the Commission on Social Determinants for Health really to give a sense of the ratchet effect uh, insofar as it's not just greater predisposition to tuberculosis that the poor may have, uh, but it's also that they're less likely to access care, less likely uh, to complete treatment, 
and much more likely to suffer impoverishment uh, due to the cost of TB care. Um, so this two, three, four, five is, uh, is more indicative of this uh, relative um, 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 probability of uh, not completing uh, the, um, you know, uh, complete access to treatment or doing it without uh, economic uh, uh, or financial ruin. And so I always like to come back to the inverse care law uh, because it was Julian Tudor Hart in this country uh, by looking at uh, the NHS in its early days or relatively early days in, in, in Wales uh, where he observed that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. And, and I think what's so fundamental about this observation is that it was by no means specific uh, to the UK. Uh, and when we look at this um, revealed behavior of health systems, we see it uh, across uh, virtually all countries. Uh, beyond that, when we look at some of the MDG priorities um, and, and look at some of the assessments which have identified, well, what is preventing us from getting to better levels of coverage for HIV, TB, malaria, or childhood immunization? Those are all priorities in the current MDG um, effort. Uh, you can see that there are a common set of systems issues that uh, are cut across um, these various different intervention areas. For HIV, HR crisis is identified as one of the top issues, but it's also identified by the TB folks, by the malaria folks, and also by the immunization folks. And it's these common bottlenecks that raises the issue and the importance of perhaps looking more fundamentally about how, at how the system is dealing with these key inputs or these key characteristics of the system that can't be dealt with uh, as effectively or efficiently through each single disease um, control program. Um, when I was at, uh, at WHO, we were very concerned about the shortage uh, of health workers, and um, in order to give it some sense of magnitude, uh, we quantified um, the number of health workers uh, that were missing relative to the number that were needed in order to scale up essential interventions to achieve the health-related MDGs. And when we did that, we found there were 57 deficit countries and a total of 4.3 million more health workers that were needed. Now, when you looked at that in terms of what it meant in a specific context, it wasn't simply a function of increasing the size of the medical school class by 5%, right? It was looking at actually tripling or quadrupling the production capacity, or looking at having the rates of attrition due to medical migration, or perhaps to um, very difficult and dangerous working conditions. Right? So it really raised this issue that one needed to look at the subsystem of the health workforce if one was really going to address this problem in a significant way, such that the health workforce was no longer the primary constraint to scaling up. But in addition to not achieving goals, health systems can actually come back and sting us in a big way. And this is the case of XDR-TB, because in 2005, 2006, when we were looking at XDR, extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis in South Africa, the assessment of the primary cause was poor delivery of TB services. This wasn't some natural mutation of the bacteria. This was induced by a failure to provide reasonable services, not enough vehicles, inadequate supervision of patients, interruption in supply chains. These are all things that are characteristics of systems that are not working as they should. And then when we look at the way health systems are financed, um, the picture is very concerning in low-middle-income countries because unlike this country and a number of other OECD countries, um, most low-middle-income countries continue to finance their system in the most inefficient and inequitable way possible. 
which is by having patients pay when they're ill out of pocket at the point of service. Now there's not a shred of evidence anywhere that supports that as a way to finance your health system. Yet, uh, you know, 55 years into official development assistance, uh, we still uh, really don't have any significant efforts to fundamentally change the way in which health systems are being financed in low middle income countries. And you have actually a perverse effect on this. Um, this is a cartoon uh, that says, when I grow up, I want to go into medicine and help people who can pay out of pocket. Right? It's quite a good business, um, and uh, you can profit from that. Uh, you won't be surprised that this cartoon comes from the United States. Um, but um, in many respects, uh, this is one of the perverse, um, I think, side effects of uh, uh, really the wrong way to think about financing healthcare. We've seen some, I think, very interesting observations with respect to performance in health, and uh, this, this is really um, Preston Curve, Sam Preston, a demographer, who's looked at the relationship between GDP per capita and life expectancy, and he's looked at that over time. But what you see is you see high performers who are above the line and low performers below the line. Um, and that analysis led Angus Deaton, uh, an economist from Princeton, to make this observation. Uh, in a lecture in 2006, in which he said people in poor countries are sick not primarily because they are poor, but because of other social organizational failures, including health delivery, which are not automatically ameliorated by higher income. And for anybody who's looking at the um, a move of many low-income uh, countries um, on the coattails of sovereign wealth and natural resources towards middle-income status, we can see increases in per capita income in aggregate, uh, but you can also see them not being accompanied by improvements in health delivery. So we have a situation uh, where we have widespread shortfalls in health delivery. Uh, we fall short on scale, safe, proven, and cheap interventions not reaching those in need. Uh, the scope of interventions is often lacking. Uh, we're not getting comprehensive services um, uh, that are responding to population need uh, and expectations. Uh, distribution is bad. Those with unmet needs are disproportionately those with lesser means. We have the problem of erring too often, putting patients and population at risk because of poor quality. Uh, and fundamentally, I think we have a massive deficit in systems capabilities. And these are primitive frameworks and responses for dealing with the complex challenges of the health delivery system. So, how do we manage this? Um, and so, um, what we do, uh, and I think we need to do, is we need to continue to set ambitious targets for improved delivery uh, in health. Um, and it's based on observations like this from Sir Michael Marmot, who said there's no good biological reason why someone living in Sierra Leone's life expectancy should be, life expectancy should be a full 50 years lower than someone living in Japan, right? So this is not immutable. Uh, these shortfalls are things that can be overcome. Uh, but as Paul Collier has reminded us in his book, The Bottom Billion, although the plight of the bottom billion lends itself to simple moralizing, the answers do not. And so we need to go beyond the moral case and actually think about taking action and ideally, action that is informed or that provides an incentive to generate knowledge and know-how to achieve these targets. In moving forward, we all should always look backwards uh, because we find, if we do look at history, that there are many who have come before us uh, who have led the way um, in very impressive ways, and, and Sir Edwin Chadwick 
uh, was, I think, um, really, in many respects, the, the founder of public health, uh, his report on the sanitary conditions of laboring poor in Great Britain, and gave a focus uh, to this city, uh, where health conditions at that time, uh, at, relative to other parts of the country, showed uh, huge deficits in life expectancy, and you can see life expectancies of laborers in Liverpool in 1840 were uh, a big 15 years um, relative to laborers in, in Rutland. That report uh, was really groundbreaking on many fronts uh, because out of it came uh, the whole idea of a district medical officer. Um, and I love this quote, uh, that for the general means necessary to prevent disease, it would be good economy to appoint a district medical officer independent of private practice with the securities of special qualifications and responsibilities to initiate sanitary measures and reclaim the execution of the law. And so that's quite a large mandate. Uh, but I like it in particular because it was uh, heretofore an unidentified catter. Uh, this was not a reference to a medical clinician that was necessary to address the problems of laboring populations in the ports of Liverpool, but rather a public health officer, a district medical officer with a whole set of competencies that were deemed necessary to address the problem, uh, which go well beyond um, those that uh, you would imagine uh, are needed by a clinician dealing with a patient. But um, there was actually a really a very um, uh, interesting period at that time because if you looked at the critical public health occupations in Liverpool, it wasn't only the medical officer of health. Uh, there was a borough engineer, um, again, very important and, and uh, interesting name of that engineer was Newlands. Um, and then they had an inspector of nuisances. Uh, and that person's name was Fresh. Uh, uh, and they had scavengers uh, and lodge house inspectors and house to house visitors. And to me, again, uh, when I read this uh, history, uh, I was absolutely uh, inspired by the creativity uh, and the recognition that you could uh, generate catters that were necessary to address a problem. And in fact, what we saw when there was a sustained effort uh, to clean up Liverpool, uh, to move towards more salubrious conditions uh, it had a dramatic impact on life expectancy. So we need to think about the links between health and wealth. Um, and when we go back to the global picture uh, in this day and age, we have this um, uh, lamentable figure of greater than 100 million people that are impoverished by medical expenses each year. Uh, we have very um, uh, strong evidence coming out of a recent commission uh, on investing in health, uh, led by Larry Summers, a, a former chief economist of the World Bank, uh, who reported that 24% of full income growth in developing countries over the last, uh, uh, or the period 2001 to 2011 was uh, uh, due to improvements in survival. And that 10% increase in life expectancy is associated with a 0.4% increase in annual economic growth. And so this is very important because we have to uh, continue to make the case that health is an investment, an essential, essential investment, and not a frivolous consumption activity. And I say this working at the World Bank, where part of our job is to convince finance ministers to invest adequately and appropriately in the health sector. So, We've been making a case for universal health coverage, uh, which is basically looking at this intimate link and, and positive synergy uh, uh, between the health sector and the broader economy. And it relates to the fact that better health outcomes lead to better development outcomes and better financing of the health system can reduce poverty and hardship and obviously increase productivity and equity. And that relates to the two goals that uh, James Ross just uh, told us about. One is to end extreme poverty by 2030, 
uh, and second is to boost shared prosperity, and that's measured by the share of income um, in the bottom 40% of the population. And these are the ambitious targets uh, that the World Bank has set. Uh, this is Jim Kim, our president, uh, who's also a physician, uh, together with Margaret Chan at our spring meetings in, in April, uh, where uh, they were talking to the slogan, take on universal coverage and end poverty. When we translate those goals into the health, nutrition, and population global practice that I'm running, there are really three points of entry that we're working on. Um, first is to really improve financial protection, and that is translated such that no one is kept in or pushed into poverty due to out-of-pocket expenditures for health care. The second is to improve service coverage such that everyone receives the quality health services they need and is protected from public health risks. And the third relates to health society, healthy societies such that all societies invest in the structural foundations of good health, which include water and sanitation, education, social protection, transport, gender, environment. And we're very important, we, we mention that uh, uh, very deliberately at the bank because our other sister sectors um, work directly in those areas and therefore we have a relative comparative advantage to engage uh, those sectors for health ends. So if we're going to move towards those ambitious uh, uh, targets, then uh, I, I think we need what I like to call a third wave of research in global health. And it basically um, relates to uh, a typology uh, which is very crude, but uh, one where I think we've done very well in health research uh, to date. The first wave is biomedical, and this dates back to Pasteur, um, but has been moving forward since uh, and uh, is associated with all sorts of exciting breakthroughs on many fronts, uh, and we need to obviously continue to push forward on the biomedical. The second is a much newer wave and relates to the emergence of clinical epidemiology in the mid-1960s. Uh, so prior to 1960, there was very little population-based assessment of clinical effectiveness of care. And uh, in the last 50 years, we've seen an enormous explosion of uh, really um, uh, systematic evidence on what we're doing um, with patients, which has led us, I think, to many uh, counterintuitive insights on what works and what doesn't. Uh, and I think as reflected in some of the discussions today with respect to the Cochrane collaboration, uh, this area of health research is really moving forward uh, very well, um, about 50 years young at this point in time. The third wave that I think is more nascent is what I would call systems or the science of delivery research. And this relates to try and understand the complex behaviors of the whole system and understand it in such a way that you can generate evidence and standards of evidence that would allow one to manage that complex behavior uh, more effectively and efficiently. When we think about universal health coverage, um, one has to break it down and conceptualize it effectively. And this is a cube uh, that was stolen uh, by WHO from uh, two European researchers, uh, Reinhard Busa and uh, Silvio Schletti, um, and has become renamed the WHO cube uh, for universal health coverage. Um, but uh, the three axes of this cube, which are very important, are first along the front, the population covered from zero to 100%. Uh, the second axis, um, which is the depth axis, is the percentage of financing that falls into the prepayment category from zero to 100%. And then the y axis, or the vertical axis in the back, is the interventions that are covered in a benefit package in a given country. Uh, ranging from the least costly uh, and most cost-effective to the most, most costly and least cost-effective. And the idea is that societies should move towards filling that cube in a progressive way. How you do that, though, is defies a one-size-fits-all, and this is where we really need to think about riding this third wave of evidence. 
Uh, this was a caricature of me when I sat at WHO. Uh, I had a little more hair then. Uh, my nose, I think, was about the same size. Um, and this is what I used to do with, with books on my desk. Um, I'd push them that way, and you could see uh, the effect it would have uh, at the end of the day, a little bit of a domino. And this is really just uh, a slide that, that is an entry point into the interconnectedness of making a change in a system. If you change one thing, uh, the whole system uh, will change. So let us look at this in terms of uh, the th uh, two axes of universal health coverage. The first is service um, coverage. And we really need to think about how to break the inverse care laws, right? Julian Tudor Hart's um, really fundamental um, observation on healthcare systems delivery uh, is one that we need to think about how do we systematically break the inverse care law. And here's some evidence uh, from Bangladesh that was written up in The Lancet uh, uh, in 2013, which shows trends in immunization coverage by asset quintile. And it's moved from a very inequitable situation to a much less inequitable situation. And when you look at the gender disparities in immunization coverage, uh, they've been eliminated entirely. And this is in a country uh, which Henry Kins Kissinger uh, prophetically and pathetically uh, 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 referred to as a basket case when it was born in 1971. Uh, but uh, here, a uh, country that uh, many thought uh, uh, this sort of progress was not possible as defied expectations and in many respects is breaking the inverse care laws. On service delivery, we need to really recognize that NCDs can no longer be ignored. Uh, I quite like this slide because um, I was in China at a summit uh, with African heads of state uh, last year, and uh, we were looking at ways in which China and Africa could collaborate. And everybody was talking about China's success in eliminating communicable diseases and how that would be useful for Africa. And then we thought, well, what problems do they share? And we looked at NCDs and uh, injury mortality, and we saw that the age-standardized mortality rates for both NCDs and injuries were higher in Africa than they are in China. And so this was identified as another area for collaboration. Uh, just because Africa has a high communicable disease burden does not mean that it does not have a high non-communicable disease burden. And it's hard to ignore that uh, when you have rates as high as these. We need to think about how to measure effective coverage. And effective coverage is not simply contact coverage. It's quality adjusted and often linked to an outcome of interest. Um, and so here from, from Chile, you can see that there's quite good coverage for MDG interventions. Uh, but when it comes to effective coverage of the NCD interventions for high blood pressure, diabetes, depression, uh, you can see that the performance of the service coverage is much lower indeed. Uh, composite measures are very important when we think about the behavior of the whole system because often a single measure doesn't give us that sense of how the whole is performing. And so together with WHO, we've been looking at cross-country uh, composite measures of service coverage and have come up with composite measures for coverage for preventive services as well as treatment services. And this allows us to compare the relative performance of aggregate coverage for prevention and treatment across regions. And you can see not only the average, which are the diamonds in the middle, but you can see the uh, top and bottom uh, performers, uh, the bottom quintile, lowest 20% and the top 80% coverage as well. So you get a sense of the relative disparity uh, in those regions uh, as well. But it's not simply about measuring coverage. It's also about thinking how you can get more value for money. There are different ways of implementing services which will get you much closer to where you want to go uh, than other ways. And at the bank, we've been 
running a results-based financing program now for the last five years. And what we're finding is that we get about 25% greater results for a given investment when we systematically structure incentives into the delivery system than if we didn't uh, structure incentives into the delivery system. And so this is good evidence where you can not only get better coverage, but better quality of interventions um, if you think about how to systematically structure incentives uh, into the delivery system. We need to think about new models of primary care. So it's not just a single service to deliver, but actually a way of structuring models of care. And this is evidence from Brazil, uh, where in their family health program, uh, which they set up in 1998, uh, they systematically scaled this uh, multidisciplinary approach to community health service um, uh, across the country, and you can see over time that it goes from very low coverage at the beginning of the program uh, to quite complete coverage, greater between 75 to 100 uh, percent coverage by 2006. So scaling of that model of care so that there really is a front line or, uh, or a primary care option uh, for the majority of the population. If we look at financing of coverage, um, we need to move beyond Bismarck and beverage. Uh, Bismarck uh, was responsible for the multi-payer system that was employer and employee based, which is also referred to as social health insurance. And beverage, as many of you know in this country, uh, really wrote the report that led to the taxed finance single payer comprehensive service, comprehensive service free at the, and free, uh, comprehensive services and free at the point of service, otherwise known as the national health service in this country, and which has also been a model for many many other countries. The problems with it is that the, both of those systems are dependent on two things. Uh, one is a strong and large formal employment sector. And the second is a very significant capability of tax collection. And these two conditions are often not present in low and middle income countries. And so if low and middle income countries are going to move towards prepayment or greater financial risk protection, then we need to think uh, about going beyond uh, the Bismarck and beverage models. And there are many emerging financial innovations um, with respect to financial risk protection. Cambodia has health equity funds. Uh, Pakistan has mobile phone facilitated access to grants uh, to cover costs for catastrophic care amongst the poor. And in Bangladesh, a buffer fund uh, has been set up by BRAC, uh, which is providing low interest loans to cover costs of catastrophic care for the poor and non-poor. But we also need to think about excise tax. Um, and this is an area where the bank is particularly interested uh, because we know that uh, the single greatest opportunity to curb NCDs is through tobacco taxation. And Prabhat Jha has done a nice paper which showed that a 50% rise in tobacco price from tax increases in China would yield a prevention, would prevent 20 million deaths and generate $20 billion a year in revenues over the next 50 years. Uh, so when you look at that prospective revenue chain and, um, and uh, time uh, benefits in terms of um, health, uh, it's hard uh, to argue against uh, moving forward on tobacco taxation. Unfortunately, if you look across countries, um, we're really not implementing it uh, as we could or should. We have to look, when we do implement universal coverage reforms, uh, whether they're working. And here from Thailand, we've seen that health impoverishment um, took a, uh, uh, a significantly lower trajectory uh, after introduction of the universal coverage scheme in 2001. And, and so you can see um, the difference in levels of impoverishment uh, both after UCS or if there had been no universal coverage scheme. When you map that subnationally, uh, you can see over time you go from a very dense and dark picture of high levels of impoverishment 
um, arising from healthcare expenditure uh, in 1996. And if you follow that through to 2008, you can see uh, a lightening of the map uh, virtually everywhere, uh, which is indicative of a shared benefit um, across most of the country. But even if you get service coverage and financial coverage right, it's not clear that you're going to have the right impact uh, from universal health coverage reforms, and so you really need to measure those impacts. So if we look at the family health program in Brazil, we found a dose response, okay? A 10% increase in family health team coverage resulted in a 4.6% decrease in infant mortality. And so that sort of dose response is really the evidence, hard evidence, that one would like to see with respect to not only are you improving coverage, but you're also having the intended equity uh, health impact that you'd like to see. Another very interesting and I think um, model program is our Arge Arge Argentina's Plan Nacer. And this was an incentivized finance scheme, scheme which was really targeting um, uh, marginal or disadvantaged provinces in the northeast of that country. And so there was a double type of effort to, one, improve enrollment in the health insurance program, and secondly, to improve health outcomes of poor mothers and their children. Uh, and this involved a transfer from the federal government to the provincial governments, uh, and then a further transfer from those provincial governments to health facilities. And each of those transfers was done on the basis of results agreements that were externally audited. If you look at the results, you can see increases in tetanus vaccination relative to controls uh, and comparing beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries. And you also see increases in vaginal delivery or decreases in the rates of C-section. And I mention that because often what we see uh, when more resources are provided to the health sector, you see over coverage of C-sections because they reimburse at a higher rate than vaginal delivery. Uh, but in this case, what, you, what you've seen is what you'd like to see, which is actually lower rates of C-section because of the way in which the program was implemented. Most importantly, uh, what we've seen uh, in Plan Nasser is a reduction in neonatal mortality uh, and a reduction in low birth weight babies. And when we look at what, what is responsible for those reductions, a full 54% of what explains the reduction in neonatal mortality relates to good access to preventive uh, uh, maternal antenatal care. 46% relates to postnatal uh, support of uh, neonates. So the lessons are um, from the Plan Nasser that you can get more and better prenatal care, better birth outcomes, less neonatal mortality, and you don't see a negative effect on the non-beneficiary outcomes. Um, it's innovative uh, because the incentives that were used to achieve those results were very small in percentage of total financing and it leveraged the larger uh, majority share of the existing government, government financing uh, and ended up increasing productivity. The last bullet on this is that this could be a very important model for maternal neonatal child health for middle income countries in the post-2015 period. And I say this because many of the countries that are low income con uh, countries currently will be middle income certainly by 2030, if not by 2020 or 25. And that will raise fundamental questions about whether the predominant form of overseas development assistance at the moment, which is grant financing, will still be uh, a viable option. And what we've seen in Plan Nasser in Argentina is that they borrowed um, from the bank at market interest rates to implement that program. So it wasn't a grant-financed program, but it did manage to address the issue of a deep pocket of disadvantage and poor performing area of a middle-income country. And we all know that the majority of the poor uh, will be uh, found in middle-income countries as we move forward. So I think uh, there may be some very important lessons there. 
Finally, and this is perhaps less interesting to this crowd, but uh, very important for all those who study the dismal sciences as I do. Uh, I know there are a few dismal scientists in this group, um, but so if you do implement universal coverage reforms, are you going to uh, bankrupt the economy, slow economic growth, uh, or will it actually, as it should, increase economic growth? And the theory is that if you don't have to worry about paying for your health care out of pocket, you won't carry huge wads of money in your pocket or keep huge wads of money under your mattress. You'll spend that money because you know that you will get protection and access to care when you need it without having to worry about having to pay for it. So savings rates go down and consumption goes up in theory. And so this is a study that was done in Thailand uh, by the World Bank group, and I'd say proudly not by my group, because we would have been conflicted. We would have wanted to see a result like this. Um, they, uh, my colleagues in the uh, macroeconomic and fiscal group, did this study to see if, in fact, um, there was increased private consumption in the setting of the implementation of the Thailand Universal Coverage Scheme. And indeed, there was. And so this suggests that reforms towards universal coverage are not likely, at least in the Thai uh, context, to slow down the economy. In fact, they have quite the opposite effect. So let me finish by uh, making an argument that I don't think will be a uh, difficult one to make to you, but really is the need for us to invest in better science and better practice of the science to inform health delivery. Uh, David Peters and colleagues uh, did a very nice book on health services research in which uh, they showed uh, and revealed a whole set of problems uh, with delivery or systems research. One, uh, the problems with taxonomy and conceptual rigor, uh, problems in design and methods, uh, weak measures uh, across the spectrum from inputs to outputs to outcomes, problems with generalizability in various contexts, lack of standards for assessing strength of evidence, and limited understanding of the needs of decision makers related to evidence on what works and what doesn't. So a pretty damning set of issues related to this field. Um, and I think uh, we can't ignore them uh, if we're serious about moving forward. And we have to do it recognizing that in other areas, particularly clinical um, evidence, um, the shortcomings with respect to delivery research are increasingly visible. Because in clinical evidence, there are well-established gold standards. There are very clear ta taxonomies, hierarchy, hierarchy of methods, strength of evidence criteria, uh, and standards for research synthesis. And we saw some of that in play today with Cochrane and, and other things. Those are difficult to translate directly into systems research. And if systems research is unable to come up with similar rigor, uh, it's going to have difficulty standing on its feet. So what do we do? I think we make better use of some of the existing tools. One of my favorite is the Tanahashi um, a model for looking at the step declines in coverage as you look through the value chain of accessing services. Um, and so uh, this paper, which I think is one of the classics in public health, really looks at the issue of um, how you move from what optimally you would like as coverage uh, to what ends up being effective coverage due to a whole set of issues related to availability, accessibility, acceptability, and contact coverage. This is a great framework. It's not perfect, but it could be modified and developed and used much more systematically in delivery research than it is. And having been a dean of a school of public health, um, uh, I was surprised when I uh, took over the curriculum that there wasn't more of the Tanahashi uh, in the curriculum. And together with UNICEF, we created a set of things called Tanahashi Rounds, uh, where we took on delivery challenges for priority interventions in the context of Bangladesh and systematically looked at the issues that were getting in the way. 
But we also have to go beyond existing tools and develop and review new methods. And I say new in quotes here because the economists have stolen uh, the epidemiologists' uh, gold standard. Uh, and so if any of you have read Poor Economics, uh, this is really sort of the celebration of the randomized control trial uh, as the basis to get truth in any social intervention. Um, and to the point that there was a, an op-ed in the uh, New York Times which celebrated the economists uh, who had written this book and others in the field uh, because they had invented something called the randomized control trial. Um, now, I, I say review those new methods because those of you who might think that the randomistas don't have the answer for everything uh, might want to develop uh, some criteria about when it is appropriate uh, to randomize and when it isn't appropriate to randomize. Uh, but uh, there's no doubt that uh, this has um, really revolutionized health economics uh, or economics in general, and it's an area where we need to think about its appropriate applications in delivery. Uh, but more fundamentally, uh, systems thinking and how we begin to embrace uh, complex adaptive systems thinking and some of the uh, methods and measures that go along with that uh, I think are the frontiers in this area. We need to look also at evaluating innovations in particular areas and here's an example from Bangladesh that I was associated with but uh, we were tasked to scale up uh, front level uh, midwives um, in the context of trying to achieve MDG5 and we came up with a hub and spoke model and what we what this basically did is it uh, it used one university uh, to get seven uh, training sites up and going rather than to have seven universities each run a training site and so it um, maximized use of scarce faculty had a common curriculum uh, it trained uh, the midwives in their locations, these were decentralized uh, sites um, close to client and therefore were drawing on WHO standards of retention of health workers. And when we did the value for money exercise that was uh, requested politely from DFID, um, because you don't get the money unless you can show value for money, um, we we're surprised uh, that the return on investment, uh, the cost benefit of this, or the benefit cost ratio, on conservative assumptions uh, was very, very positive. Um, and so, uh, in fact, uh, at least prospectively, this looked like a, a really very good way of investing to achieve um, the outcomes that we're interested with respect to MDG5. Now, the challenge is when you look at the literature that evaluates the benefit return, uh, benefit cost ratio for education interventions in the health sector, it's a very quick read, right? And so the question is, why aren't we doing more research in this area so that we can tell uh, what would be the best way to use scarce resources for higher education of health professionals? And unfortunately, we're under-investing in this um, so that we don't have a good evidence base which would allow us to say, in fact, these are more cost-effective or will give you a better return on investment. And this is an area where I think we need to identify it as a shortfall and, uh, and put more research into it. We also need to think about the governance of health systems uh, because there's a tendency to look at things very differently depending on where you sit. In Bangladesh, if you're in the government, you see things as, this night, as, a night, as a nicely stacked pyramid. Tertiary hospitals at the top, district, you know, moving down to the community and villages. But when you look at it from another perspective, um, which is outside the government sector, it looks very different. The formal qualified allopaths are a small minority of the total and you have a very dense network of non-allopathic informal providers uh, which are the reality in terms of first line of access for most of the population. And so when you look at that, you have to ask 
um, some fundamental questions about how the system is organized and more importantly, how it's led. And here I think we can learn from other sectors. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, the first female Nobel laureate, um, uh, talked about polycentric governance of complex health systems. And I think uh, others in health have talked about structured pluralism and embracing mixed health systems. Uh, but I think these are the frontiers which will move us away from, I think, unrealistic command and control, top-down, centralized planning approaches to the health sector uh, and recognize that uh, we have a pluralism that is not straightforward to manage, but that's really the reality of moving forward in governance. Finally, I think comparative analysis of success and failure is extremely important, and, and this is a Rockefeller Foundation publication at good, uh, entitled Good Health at Low Cost, 25 Years On, and these are elements of success uh, that often are the pearls or lessons about what works that don't yield themselves necessarily uh, easily, uh, but often in a political economy, cross-country comparative analysis, uh, these sorts of things um, emerge. Uh, at the bank, we've done a 25 cross-country, um, 25 country study on comparative analysis of universal health coverage reforms, and it's striking the sorts of common patterns that you see across those countries uh, when you undertake in-depth analysis of change. In terms of improving the practice of the science, uh, I think we really have to move into models of joint learning uh, and learning collaboratives, peer-to-peer, uh, practitioner-to-practitioner. Um, for those involved in universal health coverage work, there's a joint learning network, and I think uh, the membership uh, who uh, populate that network uh, would uh, uh, all vouch for its utility in terms of bringing the lessons and experience, that tacit knowledge, as well as the more formal knowledge of how to implement specific dimensions of complex reform as ones that are very valuable to share. We need to think about greater rigor. And as I was walking over here, where I was chatting with someone and, uh, about the lack of um, uh, rigor with respect to how we deal with the issue of uh, uh, applied operational implementation systems research. And uh, here, in terms of the taxonomies, I've listed um, you know, a dozen or so. Uh, but uh, this is part uh, indicative of a young field. Uh, but if it's to mature, then we really have to begin to negotiate and understand what it is we mean uh, when we distinguish operations from applied or delivery or diffusion or evaluation formative implementation, etc. Um, these are useful terms as they bring different constituencies to this area of research, uh, but we need to sort it out a little better. Methods and measures, um, there isn't a one-size-fits-all, but we need to, if it is fit for purpose, then we need to think about the criteria that define fit. Um, how to measure uh, health system strengthening um, and criteria to assess strength of evidence. But we also need hybrid vigor, um, and that's the recognition of diverse constituencies converging on a delivery science. And I think that's in full uh, evidence in the meeting of CARD. Um, you've got uh, different groups of uh, scaling up intervention implementers from HIV. TB, maternal child health, not uh, neglected tropical diseases. Uh, but you also need those who come from the monitoring and evaluation uh, disciplines, um, and very importantly, the knowledge translators, or those that are interested in the evidence. So let me finish with an advertisement. Um, uh, a field needs a place to convene. This is obviously one of them, uh, but I've been involved in one called the Global Symposium on Health Systems Research, and we will be having our third uh, biennial gathering in 2014, later this year, in Cape Town. Uh, the focus of that uh, meeting is to look at patient-centered uh, 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 health systems, both the science and practice, and uh, we invite you all uh, to attend. I'm sure many of you will be presenting there. 
So let me finish with a, a, a clarion from our Secretary General, uh, who is uh, encouraging us to achieve and move toward universal health coverage by 2030. Thank you very much. Um, now, I, I believe the floor is open for questions and discussion. So uh, please feel free to disagree with everything I said. Please. Tim, I couldn't agree with you more. Oh. You need a, a Commons taxonomy. Mm -hmm. um, but not easy to get people to agree to what that taxonomy is and bring it into to use. And given that we're moving very quickly on page to universal health coverage, you don't need to do that. How do you think you can actually stimulate that Commons taxonomy? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't have any simple solution, but I, I would look towards some of the standard setting that we've used in other areas. You know, the International Classification of Diseases um, is, in reality, much more difficult. And we're on the 11th revision of the ICD uh, after 130 years. Uh, and I think um, we need to look at um, developing a taxonomic rigor along those lines, uh, and it's hard work. Uh, however, if we believe that there's value in having greater precision uh, about what it is we're talking about, and it gets quite fundamental, uh, just to give you one example, uh, during the pandemic flu outbreak in uh, 2006, um, there are real issues related to preparedness with respect to uh, ICU beds. Well, they tried to look at this across countries, and they realized that there was no common definition of what constituted an intensive care unit bed. All right? Okay, you say, well, everybody knows that, right? Well, in fact, it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? And so some of these, that's just a very discreet example, but, you know, some of the ways in which we look and describe systems uh, we use common terms, but in fact, we may be talking about very, very different things um, when it comes to understanding these um, across uh, across contexts. So, uh, I think there's a role for standards. Um, WHO is is very well placed to do that, and I hope it would be uh, financed sufficiently to make that discrete contribution, as it has been with respect to ICD. Please. I was struck by one of your slides where you showed a, a, a 0.4% increase in wealth raised to life expectancy of 10%. Is that correct? Uh, no, it was the opposite. Uh, a 10% increase in life expectancy is associated with a 0.4% increase in, uh, in um, uh, uh, gross national income. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Better health leads to more wealth. No, it's the other way around. Yeah, so uh, a, a significant increase in life expectancy actually gets registered independently as an independent contribution to growing the wealth of a country. I guess the, the question I have was, is, is there any single important thing about wealth that contributes to an increase in life expectancy? Well, I think there is. I think there's all sorts of things about wealth that are very good for health. And so you have this you know, this sort of um, circle between improved health and improved wealth. Uh, there's definitely a feedback um, along many lines. People invest in education, um, all sorts of other things. So um, uh, there's no question that there's a virtuous circle. Yes, please. Uh, the building on that previous uh, question, just by coincidence, I was having a discussion with a colleague of mine uh, immediately before you started speaking about the relationship between investment in health and a possible economic dividend. Um, and like you, I'd love to believe that result from Thailand was cause and effect. But that's just one country, and Gary and, and Rutter, you said, came to a similar conclusion, perhaps based on a bigger data set. But it must be very difficult to tease apart cause and effect in these kinds of studies because one fancies that the conditions which lead to the bigger investment in health are also economic conditions. 
And so using it as an instrumental variable when, it, when that's very dubious, can you really satisfy us that this is the case? We'd all love to believe you. Yeah, unlikely. Um, but you, know, you have to do your best with, uh, with messy data. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to control everything in the economy in a prospective way to sort of individually attribute um, all the various things that um, uh, may be responsible for change. But the tie story is very interesting because um, uh, the technical experts um, um, suggested it was a very bad idea for Thailand to move forward with the universal coverage scheme. Uh, this was both WHO and the World Bank who said, uh, crazy, because Thailand was just coming off the financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis in 1997. So it wasn't in the setting of enormous wealth and prosperity that they were delusional and said, oh, we're going to commit to universal coverage. It actually was in the setting of a fiscal constraint uh, that they moved forward. Uh, and the so-called experts um, at my institution advised them against. Um, and so here um, is evidence to the contrary that it is not associated with a, um, a, a decline or a a uh, contraction of the economy, but rather an expansion. Similarly, in Japan, uh, when they introduced their reforms in 1961, um, the uh, Prime Minister Abe um, associates those reforms, and he wrote about this in The Lancet in uh, September of last year, uh, with the takeoff in the economy. And now that is his association, and because he's prime minister, it must be right. Um, but um, uh, again, they took on very ambitious reforms in the early 1960s, um, and there was no evidence that taking on those ambitious reforms and financing the health sector for universal coverage uh, had actually slowed down or got in the way of, of the economy. Um, and so. Uh, I think you have to look at this under a sober lens, uh, but we won't get the level of precision that I think that we sometimes get uh, when we're looking more discreetly at um, um, you know, the level of causal attribution uh, in sort of more closed or discreet um, associations between um, uh, you know, interventions on a specific disease and an outcome. Um, one of the things I was thinking about towards the end of the lecture was uh, about the issue of poverty. Um, many people in sub-Saharan Africa who are very poor, they actually don't know that they are poor, meaning they don't know how poor they are. And um, the, for example, when they go to the dispensary or health center and they realize there is no doctor, they don't know that they can do anything about it. And you talked about the uh, 57 countries needing health workers uh, in the in 2006 report. And the models you presented uh, for Argentina or Thailand or Brazil, uh, you didn't talk about um, anything about whether there is any tested models on training health care workers or whether there is anything that has been done around uh, increasing the number of health workers in the facilities. So I was wondering whether you think, whether there is anything at all around that area or whether it is something that you or World Bank thinks that can be tried in the universal health coverage uh, um, plans that are going on. Sure. So I think you're, you're raising uh, three very important issues. Uh, the first relates to the demand for services, right? And often uh, populations that have not had access to services uh, or have access services that are not well uh, staffed <coughs> or where the dispensaries are empty uh, have very low expectations or won't even go. Um, and I think this is a very important issue on the demand side, uh, which one shouldn't lose sight of, uh, but we often see, and, 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 and this is again, I mentioned this 25 country study of uh, comprehensive reforms towards universal coverage. What we're seeing as a common denominator in those countries is that patients 
or population expectations for how the system should be delivery, uh, delivering are driving changes very dramatically. Uh, because in this day and age, um, many populations are much more connected. Uh, they know it's available in other places, and they're making their expectations known to politicians at all levels. Uh, and so we're seeing a mobilization, uh, which is something that uh, leaders or elected representatives are having difficulty ignoring. Not easy to manage, but uh, important to mention. The second thing uh, on your point, which is um, what we have seen in terms of getting workers to show up when they should, um, is uh, that when you do a de facto decentralization, okay, rather than a de jure decentralization, right? De jure is, is, is you take a policy and you say the whole system is going to decentralize. And that runs into all of the challenges of any major policy to change the system. But when you're in a more stealth mode, and you give more autonomy to district or community level providers to deliver services to achieve specific results and their incentives to provide to achieve those results, then you see that they use their common sense and understanding of how to organize those services to be more effective. And so I think there is an experience, and, and I mentioned it through the results-based financing work where we've you know, implemented in over 40 countries, which uh, suggests that one of the big um, uh, determinants of effective change is the extent to which you have a de facto empowerment of health workers at the decentralized or peripheral unit. You give them a little bit of room to run, they're smart. And if their incentive is to improve services, They'll do it. And often they're disempowered because they have no control over the, what they're doing because things are stuck in the capital in very centralized, dysfunctional bureaucracies. Right? So it's just like at the World Bank. All the people who are out in the field are doing great work. Those of us stuck in Washington are part of a, you know, a, a very ineffective, uh, you know, centralized bureaucracy. Um, the last point I'd make is uh, that I think we do need to look more fundamentally at innovative models of, of health worker um, staffing. And I think we've seen some innovations emerge, this movement towards task shifting, a sort of a revitalization of the frontline worker. I think there were some suggestions of that today. I think we need to invest much more systematically to think about how to give credibility um, and uh, uh, career structures uh, to those cadres, uh, because I think they'll be extremely important in keeping uh, viable models of care, which are frontline prevention, uh, rather than simply assuming that everything will be hyper-professionalized and moved into very exp expensive and not so efficient uh, tertiary care models of provision. So, we'll go on. Couple, we have a couple more. Yeah, I, and what, maybe what we should do is just collect them and I won't yeah, say anything. Yeah. Okay, so I had a question around uh, universal health coverage. It's intriguing to me that certainly in the literature around universal health coverage and maternal newborn health, the emphasis seems very much on removing financial barriers or how are we going to pay for this. And I find little discussion about what the content of the care should be. What exactly, is there a reason for this? Is this impossible to define? Have we already defined it? Okay, good. I, we can take a couple. Yeah, I was just talking about the public health. You have given the example of Chandvik about the 1842, and if, he, if sanitation was not developed in London, it could have been the same as other developing countries, like the same disease or burden it might be carrying. So if you look at this, the public health in a, in a quote-unquote manners, is just the, only the immunization program. No developing countries are basically putting money on safe drinking water and sanitation, and which is the most crux out, out of this work. Whatever, how much money you want to invest, it has to be basically going to the reducing the risk factor, whether we go for a universal coverage program or not, 
even we cannot achieve, we cannot guarantee equity in that. But if we focus more on prevention and huge investment is required, I know it is a very lumpy investment, but we have to build on that also how prevention should be in the public health program. In government expenditure also, you see only 5% is only public health program expenditure. Remain 95% is a curative. So again, what we are going back to the same circle and again, again going the burden, having a burden of disease again and again. We are not reducing the burden of disease unless we invest in preventive care and reducing the risk of disease. Okay, and there is one over here. Um, thanks, Tim. Great talk. Um, you had one slide. <clears throat> I think it said something along the lines of uh, going beyond the Bismarck and beverage models in, in low and middle income countries with the argument that the formal labor sector is too small and the tax base is, is, is too, too thin. Uh, but then I think what you actually said was that those countries need to be less ambitious, not go beyond, but be less ambitious than the Bismarck or beverage models. Now I'd like to question that, if, if, I, if I understood you correctly. Um, and, and with a reference to the slogan, the UHC slogan of progressive realization. And I will do it with a question to you, um, and perhaps anyone else who have, has information. What was actually the, the formal labor uh, sector coverage in Germany in the end of the 19th century? And what was the tax base in this country uh, in, the, in the middle of the Second World War when Beveridge Report came? And was it not that the investments in health through these UHC initiatives helped, with, with reference to the dialogue you just had, to strengthen the tax base and then help that progressive realization. Um, and should we not be equally ambitious in the low and middle income countries today? Thanks. Great. Um, I think we have two here. I'm just saying, and three. Do we have time? Of course. Yes. Okay. Well, so we'll just take momentum. these. Yes. Just take these, because uh, and because these are great questions. Thank you. Mine is about the slide on the inter-country analysis and the strong emerging themes in the 25 countries, mm -hmm. and it was to ask for your comment on how generalizable findings really are, where contexts are so different, politics, culture social interactions, expectations of health, maybe very, very different policies, and how, how we can use robust methods to do an inter-country analysis in that kind of context. Great. Um, my friend Hassan Mashinda couldn't make it because he t twisted his ankle playing football with his sons, but we had a conversation just before I got on the plane that's very relevant to this business of, of financing and the tax base. And so there are some quick fixes, quite big fixes, uh, some which are easier to talk about, like um, electronic ICT capacity is, is, is growing faster than anything else in the developing country, in developing countries. Um, in Tanzania, some of the tax systems have increased revenue by 300% uh, just by going electronic. Um, I just paid my tax on my car uh, through my mobile phone. These things are things that um, can move very fast in developing countries. And I think somebody made the estimate that if people like myself all paid our taxes in, instead of being um, tax-free, uh, it would be worth something like five or six times more than the entire aid budget. So, um, so there is money out there. Okay, good. Yeah, I, and one here. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, mine has to do with, uh, you talked about uh, setting ambitious targets uh, to continue to improve health. Uh, I want to say that, um, I mean, to ask you uh, from your experience, especially uh, coming from um, Africa, uh, most often times than not, we see multiplicity of initiatives in trying to, you know, resolve uh, issues of, I mean, around health generally. But we do know that uh, this multiplicity of uh, initiatives, sometimes also they have their own drawbacks. So I don't know from experience, from your own experience, uh, and going forward, if you think uh, of, 
probably we need to deviate from uh, this pattern of uh, you know, uh, trying to solve uh, health issues, uh, particularly in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Well, those are a great set of questions, and I, um, I'll, I'll give a, a, a try. On, on content of care, absolutely critical, and I think um, uh, you know, there are different approaches to choice. Um, they're rational approaches um, where you look at relative cost effectiveness and, and, and try and sort of say, well, what's important and make sure what's important is in, in the essential package. Um, and uh, I think the institutional capacity for that in many low middle income countries is very thin. And so um, I think that's an area, a priority area for um, strengthening that. Um, uh, that capacity. Um, and NICE in this country has got um, uh, some linkages to developing that institutional capacity. And it's not simply health technology assessment um, that's part of it, but it also relates to the larger political economy about how priorities are set, uh, which is, I think, also very important to bring into that. And I think that bridges into the second question, which is how do you make sure that public health or interventions that are really good for the public health, public's health are being financed. And uh, I think this is um, uh, really, really important. Um, uh, one of the things that you have uh, difficulty doing is, is uh, securing demand uh, for uh, interventions where the benefits are invisible, right? People aren't ill. Uh, uh, and therefore, the prevention of that illness isn't something that they feel, right? And this is not only specific to immunization, but it's also all the hardwiring of salubrious environments. Um, uh, at the bank, it's one of the reasons that we have the third uh, point of entry around healthy societies. Uh, we know that um, improving sanitation um, is going to make a massive difference, and, and therefore we need to keep that on the agenda and promote it as a, as a, as a critical part of the investment. Uh, again, on that, the institutional capacities for public health need to be looked at and financed. And uh, we have a number of loans out uh, for institutional strengthening of public health functions, laboratories, um, uh, water quality assessment, things like that. These are not necessarily really exciting things in and of themselves, but they're, they're, they're fundamental building blocks for public health that you need to look at. And there are ways of looking at that um, so that you can identify shortfalls. Um, in terms of the financing, the, uh, if, uh, are we being too defeatist if we say we need to move beyond uh, Bismarck and, and beverage? Um, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, for those of us who've been in health financing and promoting sort of a move towards prepayment, there's been a rather unfortunate um, turf battle between those who believe that the only way to move towards prepayment is having a universally tax finance system, and those who believe that the only way you can move forward is to have a social health insurance or an employer-employee benefit type of system. And we've seen a lot of countries um, suffer from that intransigence. And, and that's part of why I think it's important to feel that, uh, yes, Beveridge and Bismarck made huge contributions at points in time when their societies were not as evolved and, and robust as they are today. Um, but uh, I don't think that uh, we should uh, uh, limit the discussion of what the best way to move towards prepayment is based on what we said that it has to be tax financed or it has to be uh, social health insurance. I think there's a role for evidence um, on what types of prepayment systems uh, work and work at different stages of development. Uh, the idea is to move towards a greater level of prepayment and to measure um, the financial risk protection systematically as an outcome of that. And I think when you start to look at what's there, in fact, I was in Africa and Kenya about two months ago talking about their new financing of a very complex devolved system now to 47 um, uh, provinces. But 
Um, what, what struck me was how much innovation there is with health economists from the country who are thinking about different ways, uh, innovative ways of, of moving towards creating pools uh, for financing. One needs to think about a larger architecture because as you move forward, there is going to be a need to join up. We know that larger pools are more efficient and so you have to think and develop that architecture for evolution. Um, and so one shouldn't move away from moving towards zero impoverishment uh, and 100% financial protection, which I think is the big picture vision of UHC. Uh, in terms of innovative uh, methods of, of and, and this uh, links on to it, um, ICTs, um, banking, to, you know, business to business uh, transfers of resources on mobile phones and things, I think are changing um, the landscape with respect to getting better revenue generation, tax collection, etc. Uh, for anybody who knows the country of Chile, uh, they have the most efficient tax collection system in the world in part because under Ricardo Lagos, um, they tapped into Oracle, uh, where one of the vice presidents international was a Chilean national, and uh, they uh, computerized um, every retail transaction in the country. Um, and so they have a tax collection rate which is somewhere in the order of 92%, um, and it's progressive. Uh, and uh, it's uh, generated and done through uh, an electronic system uh, and I think is one that we should look at in terms of getting uh, much greater efficiency, not only in terms of revenue flows and taxing revenues, but also identifying leakages. And this is an area where the, uh, the finance minister of Nigeria is taking a big leadership role at the moment at looking at ways in which you can shut down those holes in the system where you have large outflows of money that are disappearing uh, from the general revenue stream. Um, the last questions, um, the, um, was on the multiplicity of initiatives. And, and here, I have two views on this. Um, the first view is that uh, development partners have a responsibility to figure out and understand the broader landscape in which they're working. And so if they are working with any country, uh, then they have uh, a responsibility to understand what other development partners are doing and try and join up and be supportive of uh, whatever the country's plans or activities are. Uh, and so I'm I believe that um, there's a lot of room for improvement there. There's something called the International Health Partnership Plus. Uh, we've been working with that group uh, and global health leaders to try and move towards, for example, greater alignment uh, of monitoring and evaluation systems. Um, and we've agreed to decrease the number of indicators uh, that are reported on on a regular basis from 600 to 300. Uh, that should give you some sense, but also to align them across some standardized platforms that generate that information and invest in strengthening those, those platforms. So I think there's a big agenda there and development partners could do uh, much better. In terms of managing the complexity of the health sector, and this is my second view, um, I don't think we'll ever get to a point where you can sort of control and press a button and everything will change. And you probably know in your own system, if you look at the number of different stakeholders that you need to engage on any specific issue, you recognize that you're managing a mess. Um, I call it pluralism. And so what are the methods that you bring together multi-stakeholders, right? If we're really involved, interested in getting water and sanitation moving um, and that intersectoral engagement, it isn't the Minister of Health who's going to stand up and order uh, another minister and say, you must, right? There needs to be some effective way of engagement uh, and shared responsibility and managing um, the lack of consensus, right? Because when you get vested interests in the room, as we've seen in so many healthcare reforms, 
uh, not everybody's happy, right? And so I think maturity in institutional governance in health will increasingly rely on the ability to find a common pathway forward uh, which is best in aggregate uh, but perhaps doesn't have everybody feeling like um, their interests are uh, wholly served. It's always a sign of a great lecture that uh, it provokes a lot of fascinating questions and we run seriously over time. So sadly, we've got to bring it to an end now. And in thanking Tim very much for everything this evening, I'd ask Janet Hemingway to present you with the Leader Hume Lecture Medal. Thank you. Can I just add my thanks, Tim? I don't think we could have had a better speaker tied in with the card meeting and for your inputs into card as well. Um, I think as we move... Um, generally from Millennium Development Goals to universal healthcare coverage. There are huge challenges that uh, we're all going to face um, and we look forward to working with you and the bank as we move forward. Um, but just to present you with this as the Lever Hume Lecture Medal for your contributions over time to healthcare and long may they continue. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that brings our uh, proceedings to a close, but before you disperse, I would just ask as many of you as possible to be back in this council chamber before 9 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning.